Hello and welcome to our live streaming Bible class, Hope Grows, here at Salem Lutheran Church and School. I'm Pastor Jeremy Washi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us, those who are joining us live. Thank you for joining us, those who are watching this on demand later on. Um, if you haven't yet gotten a copy of the study guide for this lesson, it is available in the description of the video below. And um, if you have any questions that come up during the study, feel free to type them in the comment section. Um, whether you're watching it live or watching it on demand. If you're watching it live, I'll uh, be able to address the questions as they come up. Um, if you're watching this on demand, I'll either be able to address the questions that you have um, in a later video, or I'll be able to answer your reply to your comment, or possibly email you as well, too. That being said, but let's begin with a prayer in light of our lesson from last time. Last time we talked about hope growing as we join with others that share our convictions as we join in the church. And so let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for bringing together your people, your people from out of the many different um, backgrounds, out of different races, and bringing us and making us one through Jesus Christ. It, it is only through you only through the blood that your son shed for us that now we stand before you as your blood-bought people. Help us to share that love in this time in which our, our, our country, our world desperately needs your love to, to grant forgiveness where it is necessary and to lead others to show, to see the error of their ways so that they can stop seeing people as as people that need to be feared, but, pe but instead people that need to be loved. And please, let, let your peace and love rule over hearts and minds, and help us to move forward. Help us to proclaim this peace and this love in a world that desperately needs it. In your name we pray. Amen. So, um, with all that in mind, last time we talked about gathering together as, as a church. We, we looked at what it meant to be um, a capital C church. To be part of the capital C Church, the, the gathering of all believers that confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then we re realized that, well, the church that we can see is that lower C Church, the local congregation, in which there are going to be members of the capital C Church. The vast majority of people that gather at a local congregation are going to be actual Christians that are part of God's actual Christian church, but since we can't read people's hearts, we can't look into the hearts of others like God can. We understand that there are going to be those who are just there going along. But we're glad they're there. <laughs> they're hearing the word of God and God's word is working at their hearts and it can break through. And so we continue our study today. We'll dive into our homework from last section. Our homework, the pattern for our homework for each of these sections is to go into the Old Testament, to, to track the history of God's people in the Old Testament. And we see how these tie into our understanding of the New Testament. So today we're in First Samuel chapter 17, and we have a familiar account. Let me get on my pen here, so we're all set to take some notes. What was the name of the Philistine champion of whom the Israelites were so terrified. So this giant was Goliath, a giant of a man. Um, Mrs. Christie, uh, our, our one of our teachers here at Salem, had a life-size portrait of Goliath hanging in our stairwell for part part of the school year, and it was. It was funny watching the children stand up next to it, and it was funny, I'm sure, for people to see me stand up next to it because you realize how tall this man was. Okay. David had three older brothers serving in the army. When he arrived at the battle front to check in on his brothers, what did he hear? He heard that Saul would enrich. Saul would, would give a reward to whoever killed Goliath. But in verse 26, David cuts to the heart of the matter. Why shouldn't the Israelites have feared Goliath? 
It didn't matter that they might earn a reward if they won against Goliath. It was the Israelites had God, the one true God, on their side. So, in verse 32, what does David say that he'll do? David says that he'll fight Goliath. He says that I'll fight him, I'll take him on. Now how does King Saul react to David's decision? He says he, he, he's, you're too young. And then he, he ultimately lets David go and David keeps on saying uh, that he wants to do this, that he will do this. You see, remember, David isn't motivated by the money, by the reward that King Saul has put out there for anyone that would kill Goliath. David is motivated by his faith. He is disgusted when he hears Goliath blaspheming the name of his God. And we should too. The attitude that Goliath has, or that David has when he hears Goliath blaspheming the name of the Lord, should be the attitude that we have when our media makes fun and mocks Christian teaching. When we have friends that don't believe as we do and that they openly make fun of us for holding to the confession that we do. Now I'm not saying that you should take out five smooth stones and sling one at someone's forehead in reaction to it, but we should equally be enraged. Okay. So, since Saul's armor is too cumbersome, with what does David go to battle with this nine-foot giant? And I gave it away in my reaction, but he goes into battle with, not with the equipment of a warrior, but with the equipment of a shepherd. Five smooth stones and a sling. And I remember as a kid I used to think that it was this type of slingshot that we think of Dennis the Menace using. But no, this was a, a sling where, where he, it was a, a big long strap that you put w with a pouch at the end of it where you put stones in, in one end and then you'd whirl it around and you'd let go of one of the ends of the strap and that would allow, allow the stone to fly off in the air. and a very tough to aim weapon. But David, he, he had time to practice with it because he was a shepherd. This would have been one of the weapons that he used to keep predators away from his sheep. And this is what he goes to battle with. So what is Goliath's reaction to David? Goliath's reaction to David. I'll get my pen back. Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Because, honestly, this would have been a weapon. Wild dogs that would have tried to get the sheep, wolves. This is what David would have used for those types of animals. And, and Goliath says, am I a dog that you're going to come at me with, with sticks? David gives an outstanding confession of faith in verses 45 to 47. In your own words, why was he so confident as he went to battle? Well, simply put it, he trusted in the Lord. He trusted in the Lord God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God who created all the universe, the God who promised that through that through the family of Israel, the family of Abraham, all nations would be blessed. God promised, God, David trusted in that God. And what's the end result of the battle? David kills Goliath. Period. Now, in studying this portion of Scripture, this familiar Sunday school lesson of scripture. It can be easy to twist it. It can be easy to twist it into, well, 
What are my Goliaths that I am facing? And how am I a David? Don't default to putting yourself into biblical stories. The point of this story is not for you to put yourself in David's sandals. He is an example of how to live our life of faith. But the point of this story is not for you to try and, and see what giants am I being confronted with, but it's an example you have to see how God was with David in this time and how God is faithful and God conquered Goliath for David. You, you see, really, in this story, David isn't so much a... You're not, you don't get a stand-in for David, but David is really a stand-in ultimately for Jesus who took on the, our greatest enemy who succeeded where we would fail if you want to try to put yourself in anyone's sandals in this story put yourself in the sandal, sandals of the Israelite army that were too afraid to go to battle but even then let the point of this story be not that with God that God will take down all my Goliaths what if God doesn't what if there's a big giant of a problem in your life that your entire life doesn't go away? What's your faith going to do then? Now trust that God has the power to conquer enemies. And God is the one who's in control. Okay. So, later in Israelite history, long after David, the Israelites became idolatrous and, for the most part, they rejected God. God sent the prophet, God sent them prophet after prophet to call them to repentance. God allowed some of the Israelites to be taken into exile and warned that if the nation continued in its stubborn, sinful ways, that God would allow the whole nation to be exiled to Babylon. To teach this in a very concrete way, God had the prophet Jeremiah walk around with a yoke on his neck, symbolizing what would happen to the Israelites if they failed to repent. So, let me get my screen back here. Okay, while Jeremiah is walking around with this yoke around his neck, a false prophet named Hananiah comes with a totally different message. He said that the Israelites weren't in danger of going into exile. He said that those he he said that those who had earlier been taken away would come back. To make this message more dramatic, what did he do to Jeremiah? In verses 10 and 11, we're told that he broke the yoke off of Jeremiah's shoulders. He took this object lesson that God had wanted Jeremiah to use to preach to the people of the yoke of their sin and this false prophet Hananiah took it off of Jeremiah's shoulders as if to say what he's saying is completely false when Jeremiah was a true prophet. Why was this teaching so dangerous for the Israelites? Now remember, they were stubbornly caught in rebellion against God at this time. This teaching was so dangerous because it's what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear that they were okay, that God wasn't angry with them for their sin. It encouraged them in their unbelief. It let them think that what they are doing was just fine. This is why it's so irritating when I hear of churches that want to call themselves Christian, that will call open sin okay, or good, or pleasant, and will call those who hold to biblical teachings bigots. Because they do the same thing that Hananiah was doing when it came to Jeremiah. Okay, number three, in verses 12 through 16, we hear the Lord's reaction to Hananiah's false teaching. What was God's reaction? He said, you broke wood 
but created iron. I will remove you from the earth. And what was the outcome? Hananiah died. God would not put up with his false teacher who was blatantly going against God's prophet and he wiped him from the earth. What does this account teach us about God's attitude towards those who add or subtract from his word? It tells us that he's serious about dealing with them. God, God holds those who, whose task it is, who take up the task of proclaiming his word, he takes that very seriously. As a pastor, I'm answerable to God ultimately for what I teach and preach. And, I, and it is demanded of me that I be faithful to what God has asked me to be faithful to. Okay. Circle the statement which is most correct. Number one. What do you think? A saint is a very good Christian who has died? Or a saint is anyone who believes in Jesus? Well, it's, it's B. A saint is anyone who believes in Jesus. So, those of you who are watching, who believe in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, that He came to live and die and rise for you, you are already a saint. You have already been made holy in the eyes of God. You are His holy, set-apart people. You don't have to, no one, you don't need to wait until the Roman Catholic Church declares someone a saint. Saints are those who believe and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, even now. Okay, number two. The Holy Christian Church is made up of, well, this is not just all church members, because remember, there can be those who belong to a local church that aren't actually Christians, but just go through the actions, but the Holy Christian Church is made up of all believers in Jesus. Now, number three, the Holy Christian Church is called holy. It's B. Excuse me. The Holy Christian Church is called holy because all the people in it have been cleansed by their sins of the work of Jesus. It's not because of our own works. Okay, number four, the Holy Christian Church, abbreviated here, HCC is made up of, is it just Wisconsin Evangelical Synod Lutherans? Or is it made up of all those who believe in Jesus as their Savior no matter what church body? It's B. If you can, this is, is where we take great comfort. That where Christ is preached, where Christ crucified is preached, there there will be believers. Even if that church does have some false doctrine, there it's by God's grace that the message of the gospel works through and in spite of the false doctrine preached and causes people not to believe that, but to hold on to Christ and Him crucified. But because there are false teachings, because there are those who teach improperly, that makes us want to point out those teachings because those teachings put people in danger. Okay, number five, all, all people who are members of a congregation are going to heaven? Or is it some people who are members of a congregation may be going to hell, but only God knows who those people are? It's B. Remember, just because someone belongs to a Christian church in this life does not, does not guarantee that they are part of the Holy Christian Church. That is, the church that God will... God will bring God will bring us into for all eternity. And we are already members of by virtue of faith. Okay. Number six. Um, this one's A. All Christians are equally special and important. It doesn't matter if you have a position in a church, if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, or or if you're a lay member, all people are equally important and special. Number seven. God wants me to join the church which teaches 
each truth of the Bible accurately. If you're a member of a church and you, through, through study, through maybe even watching this study, have come to realize that the church you currently attend doesn't accurately teach what the Bible says, you should leave that church. You should find a church that teaches and preaches what God's Word says. If you're watching this and you're not a member of Salem, and you're realizing that you attend a church that does not accurately teach what God's Word says, reach out to me. Go to our website, salemwells.net. Um, through there you can find my contact information. Contact me. I'd love to help you try to find a solid, biblical, Bible-believing, teaching church. Okay. Number eight. Most of the time, false teaching and false teachers will be difficult to spot. This is because some people who teach falsely, they might not even be aware of it. It might be so ingrained in them that they are not even aware they're teaching falsely. And this is also because those who are teaching falsely on purpose, they're going to do everything they can to hide it. Okay, number nine. B, to refrain from joining a congregation in which error is taught or tolerated shows my love for others. By refusing to join a congregation, a church, where there is false teaching there, it, it's a sign to others that say they shouldn't be there either. Okay, ten. A, oh, let me get my ten back. Joining a congregation is a good opportunity to make a public confession of faith in Jesus. Where you go to church, where you are a member in a church, tells the world, I believe what this church teaches. It's a confession. Okay, some thought questions in your own words. What do we mean when we use the term Holy Christian Church? Well, since we aren't able to have a, a discussion here, a discussion format reply, let me just say, it's all people who believe in Jesus as their Savior throughout time and throughout the world. This is an invisible church. So the term Holy Christian Church includes all of those believers who patiently waited for Jesus to come and believed in the promise of the Messiah. It's for all the believers that, that have existed since Jesus lived, rose, and died. It contains probably, maybe even family members of yours going back generations. It, it contains people the world over right now. So, number two, name several reasons why, why it's important to join a congregation and to actively participate. It keeps you in contact with the means of grace. And by the means of grace, remember we mean God's Word and the sacraments, baptism for your children and for new members, Holy Communion, regularly for members to actually take in, in their hands and in their mouths the very body and blood of the Lord and with that forgiveness of sins. And it, it gives encouragement to others. Now even though we're not able in Milwaukee still to have larger gatherings, I know many of our members have been contacting each other, encouraging one another on the phone. I've been in contact with, with many of you via phone, text, email, and that's been encouraging. We can still be the church even if we can't gather at our local church building, but I long for the day, and I know many of you long for the day when we can gather as a body of believers and sing God's praises and gather around the Lord's table. Okay. Number three. What are things which God wants a Christian congregation to be doing? He wants us to be growing in the Word, to be increasing our understanding of the Word, and also to be going out into the world with the Word, to bring this message, to evangelize our neighborhoods, to, to speak of God's wonder and God's power. And then you had your memory work, and you have a little article about do all Lutherans believe the same things? Short answer is no, not all Lutherans believe the same things. 
I'll let you uh, read that if you haven't already on your own. And now, let's go into our lesson for today. Hope grows as I listen to God's message. So today, we're going we're gonna to be talking about God's Word. We're going to be talking about this thing that we call the Scriptures, that we call the Bible. And let's break it down a little bit. Let's break it down into two columns, as you see on your worksheet. Old Testament. What was its original language? Mostly Hebrew, and then there are some books that are recorded in Aramaic. They're very similar languages. And in fact, Aramaic is an offshoot of Hebrew. Same, relatively, same alphabet. It's, it's, if you know Hebrew, it's not too hard to pick up Aramaic. Okay. When was it written? Roughly around the year... It began roughly around the year 1500, and then it was written up to the year 400 B.C. before Christ. That was this over 1,000 year timeline in which God inspired the writers, the prophets of the Old Testament to record His Word that we call the Old Testament. Now what is the basic content? Promises of the Savior, history of God's people of Israel, God's faithfulness, his people's faithfulness. And then the New Testament. It, the original language was common Greek. Now, another way to say this is Koine Greek. Koine is the Greek word for common. If you're um, a fan of the church band Koine, this is where they got their name. The original language of the, of the New Testament called Koine Greek. It was written roughly between the years 40 A.D. to 100 A.D. That's when God inspired the New Testament writers to the, the evangelists and the apostles. So the evangelists are those who recorded the gospel lessons. This would be Matthew, who was one of the disciples. Mark, who was not one of the original 12 disciples. He's John Mark. He comes up on the missionary journeys within Acts. And there's Luke, who... It was also not one of the original disciples. Luke is a gospel writer who is a frequent um, uh, missionary. Uh, accompany, he accompanies uh, Paul on missionary journeys, and he also wrote the book of Acts. Then there are the apostles, those, those who were the disciples who were with Jesus during his ministry. And then also the apostle Paul. And the content of the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, in the person and work of Jesus, and letters to early Christians to encourage them. Okay. So now we see all scripture is God-breathed. So although the Bible was physically written down by men, it actually came from God. This is important for us to understand. All scripture is God breathed. So, God informed the writers of the scriptures what he wanted to record in the Bible. This wasn't as when we talk about the, the Bible being inspired, we're talking about he literally inspired, he gave his spirit to tell them what he wanted them to write. He didn't inspire them the same way that an artist might be inspired by a, a sunset to make a, payment, a painting that is somewhat close to what he sees, saw with his eyes. No, God gave his original writers what he wanted them to write. The words that we have, the words that were recorded, were what were meant to be recorded. Okay. 2 Peter 1.21 For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The person of the Godhead, our triune God, three persons, one God, to whom this is generally credited, is the Holy Spirit. The fact the Bible comes from God, word for word, is called verbal inspiration. The actual words that God wanted were given to these authors 
for the benefit of you and me, that we can trust that what God gave us is His Word. Yes, what we have it has been transmitted throughout history, but the copies that were made of God's Word were so faithful and so well-preserved. Of all ancient texts that have been transmitted through history, there is more evidence for the veracity, the truth of the Bible, the authenticity of the Scriptures, than any other single ancient document. We have more evidence more archaeological proof that the words of Scripture were written when they testify that they were written, and they're written by who they say they're written by. And yet there is more doubt of the authenticity of the Scriptures than there is for any other ancient text that is out there. That's a sad truth, and yet even though we have more proof for the Bible, there are more people that doubt what the Scriptures say. It shouldn't surprise us that the devil is eagerly trying to swat away the truth of the scriptures from this world, but he hasn't he hasn't succeeded yet. <laughs> God's preserved his word to us, his church, even at this point, and of and I would dare to predict, because scripture tells us that God's word will not die away. That he will preserve it, he will save it. Okay. John seventeen seventeen, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Because it's God's word, we know it is true. Do you have a friend, family member, coworker that has a reputation for being truthful? I, I can think of a couple people in my life that I would have a hard time believing that they would actively try to lie and deceive. It's just not it in their nature from the experiences that I've had with them. Now, of course, they're humans. Of course they could lie. They, they have lied. But they have the reputation for being honest. And if they say something, I'm going to believe them. Now, when it comes to God's word, he has no reason to lie to you. What would be the motivation, what would God's motivation be for lying to us? Honestly, what would be the point? What would be the point for God to set us up for a fall? To tell us anything that is not actually the way it is. After all, he's God, there's no one more powerful than him. What he says is true. Okay. John twenty thirty one. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So most importantly, it, the scriptures, point me to Jesus, through whom God wants me to Live both now and forever. God wants you to live both now and forever. True, true life is knowing Jesus and having faith in Him. There are plenty of people who don't believe in Jesus, and I would argue that they're not truly living. Unless they have Jesus, unless they have faith in Jesus, they don't truly know life. God wants all people to have life even now. Life that leads to eternal life, not just physical life, which is only out to seek one's own good, one's own personal pleasures, but eternal life that looks to hope forever. Okay. Second Peter 3.17 Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Regular Bible study leads me 
to grow in my knowledge of Jesus as my Savior. It leads us to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. This not only causes us to become stronger, but it also protects us from error. It protects us from those that lead us astray. It protects us from all the false truths that would try to get in the way of us and what Jesus teaches. You see, the devil loves when even a small bit of false teaching gets into your understanding. And then he loves when you don't bother to check what it says in the scriptures. Because then that small bit of false teaching works its way into your mind. And it becomes ingrained there. And it can't even get to the point where when you're confronted with the truth of it, you actively fight against the truth. Okay, so now we go back and we have the full verse of 2 Timothy 3.16, which we had earlier. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So regular study, it equips me for doing all sorts of good works. Regular Bible study equips you to be able to see the needs of those around you. It equips you to be able to address the cares and worries and concerns of your family, of your neighbors, of your friends, of strangers that you may come across. It equips you to be able to share the hope that you have. I, I've, asked, I've had people ask me, how do I how do I gain confidence to be able to share my faith more? And I've said, well, it comes down to two things. First of all, study God's Word. Increase your knowledge. Memorize God's Word more. That's why there's memory treasures at the end of each of these lessons. Memorizing the scriptures isn't something that we should only do when we're young. The only Bible that you'll always be able to have at you, have with you, is that which is in your heart and in your mind, which you have made a part of you. The more you understand the scriptures, the more you're equipped for conversation, the more you're equipped to address concerns and topics that come up in real life. The more you know, the more confident you feel. And then, the second piece of advice that I have for people that want to know how to share their faith more, it's get over yourself a little bit. Sometimes, even me included, we don't take that step to share our faith because we're afraid of what people will think of us. Sharing your faith is about caring for someone else. Thinking that this might be the best opportunity to share Jesus with this person who might n not hear from anyone else. To actually speak the love of Jesus. Even if all you can say is, you know what, I, I, can, I can see that you're down, I can see that, that, that you're going through some hardships. But why don't you come with me learn more about Jesus if it's just that simple come and see invitation to come to church if you say why don't you come with me then someone responds with why then you can simply say well, because it's at church that I learn about Jesus it's at church that I learn about all that he's done for me it's a church that I have a peace that I've learned about this peace that I can have and I want you to have it too Okay, so Bible study equips us for all, doing all sorts of good works. Some principles for interpretation of the Bible. I'm going to highlight this first one in a big way. Consider the context. To be honest, by plucking a verse out of its original context, and plopping it down, 
down on a sheet of paper, you can make God's Word say just about whatever you want. And that's scary. And people do that. I'm sure I, even I've been guilty of doing that to try and push forth God's truth, but not using Scripture in a contextually truthful way. It's, it's tempting. God forgive us when we do that. But we always want to consider the verse in its original context. And that means, what was the setting that it was first spoken in? Who were these words first spoken to? If we're talking about Old Testament, New Testament. What was the people, what was the, the situation that was going on that these words were written to address? All that helps our understanding. Okay, and then number two, take the Bible literally, unless the Bible itself says otherwise. If the Bible presents something as a fact, understand it that way. Now, if the Bible says that something is a parable or a vision, understand it that way. For instance, when Jesus is talking about his parables, like the parable of the sower and the seeds, he's not saying that we actually just throw Bibles around and expecting them to create faith where they land without actually opening up and people reading them. But he's saying that this is what the scripture is, is like. What it's like to share the message. You share it with everyone. Or in the book of Revelation, where there's talk of, uh, of dragons and chains and numbers and all this weird imagery. We're told this was a vision that John received. Visions with pictures that stand in for real truths. And we get into problems when we take when we take those portions of scriptures that are vision language and we try to take them we try to take them literally. We should take them seriously, but we take them as vision language, understanding that there's a there's a there are a picture representing something else. Okay. Additionally, there are idioms and figures of speeches of speech that are generally easy to identify. Okay, another big one that we want to be sure that we highlight. These are all important, but this one. Let the Bible interpret itself. When you come across a difficult passage, go to a passage that is more clear. No passage will contradict clear truths, such as the sinfulness of man, salvation by God's grace alone, that Jesus is true God and true man. Parallel passages, passages that, that teach similarly, that teach similar things, are going to cover these truths. They are going to make difficult passages easier to understand. Okay. Ask the question, how does God get the glory? Often misinterpretation happens when we selfishly try to assign the glory to man, glory which only begot, belongs to God. When I was talking earlier about the story of David and Goliath, when we try to make ourselves David in the story, we're trying to assign glory to ourselves as the conquering victor. When that story is all about God accomplishing something wonderful, God saving his people, God standing up for, for the truth. So, another example, saying believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved can be interpreted two ways. One interpretation, that believing is the part that humans do in their salvation. Second interpretation is a person needs to do nothing for their salvation. God simply invites us to trust that he's already done it all. It's the second interpretation that gives God all the glory. And that is correct. If you ever come across a reading of scripture and you're tempted to give yourself glory because of it, understand that you probably got it wrong. And so, you can see the information for the pastor that I got this Bible study from there. Um, don't call him, call me. 
Section 2. How do I study the Bible? There are four things to look for when we study the Bible. What truths does this section teach me? How does this section convict me of guilt, the law? And how does this section assure me of God's love, the gospel? What does it lead me to pray for and to do? What truths does this section teach me? That all people... Well, first of all, let's work through these questions with these sections of Scripture. The rich man and Lazarus is from Luke 16, beginning at verse 19. There is a rich man who was, who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. He was at, he was, his, at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, was covered, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. A time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus at his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and sent Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. So, what does this section teach me? It teaches us that all people go either to heaven or hell. Hell is torment. You can't change places once you've, once you've died. Either you go to heaven or hell. The word is sufficient to get people to heaven. Spiritual riches are more important than earthly riches. How does this section convict me of guilt or law? Well, if you read it, it says when we fail to focus on spiritual matters, when we fail to, to see what's at stake, when we fail to, to see how important God's word is in this life, it shows us how we put ourselves in danger of missing out on eternal life. How does this section assure me of God's love and his, that is his gospel? That we have real riches. We have spiritual riches. We have the word. We have what we need. And someday we'll be joining Father Abraham in heaven. We'll be, we'll be carried there by angels. What does it lead? What does this section of scripture lead you to do? I pray that it leads you to fix your priorities, as it does for me. And it leads me to focus on spiritual matters, to focus on God's Word, and the importance of leading others to the Word while we still can. Now we want to look at Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his crowd had a large, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, "Don't cry." Then he went up and touched her. Then he went up and touched the briar. They were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. 
The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave them back to his mother. When they, they were all filled with an awe and praised God, a great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding countryside. Whoop, let me get back to our section here. Whoop, jumping around on me. What truths does this section of scripture teach us? Now, let me get back to where we were. The section of scripture teaches us that Jesus has power over death. He was able to heal this, this woman's son. Jesus is true God. He is compassionate. Just like Jesus' compassion in this story. The woman whose son died, she was a widow. Her son would have been the one who would have taken care of her into her old age. She didn't have a retirement account. Her son was supposed to take care of her. And with him dead, she her, her earthly hope was gone. But Jesus had compassion on her. And God uses tragic events to bring good news. How does this section convict me of guilt? The law? Sometimes we forget that Jesus has power. We forget to, to reach out to him. We, we question that God has compassion and has mercy. Just look at what's going on in our world today. The question might be that many people are asking is, where is God in all this? Well, God is in those who are reaching out in mercy to those who are not like them. God is with those that are that are sharing the message of peace and hope in Jesus Christ, even though the world seems to be crumbling down around us. When we fail to see how God can bring good out of difficulty, that's where we need this message of law. So in the story of the widow's son, what section... How does this section assure me of God's love, His gospel? It assures us that God is compassionate. It assures us that Jesus is powerful. And that God can make trage even tragedies work for our good. So, what does this lead me to pray for and to do? It leads me to pray to God to help me see His compassion, even in heartache, even in tough times, and seek His guidance. And to forgive me for doubting his power and his compassion. And to help help me view tragedy as an opportunity for doing good. Okay. Now we want to look at... Get rid of... Okay, now we got to look at some personal notes. Some practical notes for studying the Bible. Use an accurate, up-to-date translation. Some suggestions would be the NIV, the New American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, um, God's Word to the Nations, um, also the Evangelical Heritage Version. That's the edition of the Bible that are that the Wells um, is publishing through uh, our publishing house, Northwestern Publishing House. These are great resources. I'm not saying to get rid of your King James. But that can be tough to understand with the Old English. Even the New King James Bible is a good resource. Also, don't be afraid to skip around. Perhaps read the book of Genesis, then John's Gospel, then read some of the Psalms, and then some of the New Testament epistles. But just keep reading. And then also begin with prayer that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to the truths of the Scriptures. And then close with prayer concerning the, the truths that you've learned. Also, keep a note, sometimes reading long sections quickly can help to get the big picture. But then sometimes reading short sections and thinking them through through more seri more carefully can also be helpful. Sometimes it can, it can be great to read a long section of the scripture so you get a greater sense for the timeline of events and what's in the greater scope of things, but then... Sometimes you just want to narrow in on a shorter passage, a shorter portion of scripture to really mull it over and chew it over in your mind. Both ways can be good and it just might it might do, do you some good to 
read the scriptures in both ways. Mark up your Bible. Use a pen, use a highlighter to mark key verses. Write down things in the margin, write down notes, ideas, insights that you have. Um, one of the prized possessions that I have is a Bible that I got from my grandmother. After my grandmother died, um, my aunts and uncles and cousins, um, they were deciding what keepsakes uh, should go to each of the grandchildren. And uh, they thought, well, Jeremy wants to be a pastor. Jeremy's planning on going to school to be a pastor. Let's give him one of one of Grandma Ness's Bibles. And being able to look through that and, and see some of her own handwriting it's a reminder that this faith was handed down to me from grandparents to my parents now to me it's an encouragement to see some of the things that she she thought important in her study it's an encouragement to future generations but also it's a way for you to track your progress and to see how your understanding has changed or write notes to remind yourself of what you've learned. Okay. And then also set aside a specific time of day, each day, to do it. Even if it's a very short time. For instance, just say, today I'm going to study the Bible, even if it's just 15 minutes. You get up in the morning, and you don't have a whole lot of extra time before you have to make it on your day. It's not that hard to set aside 15 minutes in the morning. Or in the evening. Say, before I'm going to go to bed... I'm gonna. My bedtime is ten. Well, then I'm gonna at nine. I'm gonna take fifteen minutes. I'm gonna turn off the TV for fifteen minutes or something like that. Find a time that works for you. Okay. Summary: The Bible is God's word. It's given by God, word for word, verbal inspiration. The Bible's main purpose is to lead us to faith in Jesus as our Savior. Regular study of the Word leads us to grow in knowledge and equips us to better serve God with our life. And so we pray, Lord, open now my heart to hear, and through your Word to me draw near. Let your Word, air pure, retain. Let me, your child, and heir remain. Your Word inspires my heart within. Your Word grants healing from my sin. Your Word has power to guide and bless. Your Word brings peace and happiness. So, our hope grows as we stay in God's Word. Now you have your homework for next week. We'll, we'll look at that to start our study next time. God be with you until we meet again. Remember, God is good all the time. And at Salem, we'll continue to rise as one. God bless.